right, we're going to do the same thing we did last uh, last class with the last homework set that was due and have people uh, volunteer to, to go through their work. We already have a volunteer for the first one um, in class here. So I'm going to uh, mute my microphone and the output here so uh, use this computer. So we'll get started. Hey, can you make me? Okay, can everyone online hear me okay? Maybe a thumbs up or something? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. All right, um, so yeah, for this first one, uh, this we're basically dealing with bending in an elastic beam. And so uh, I just rewrote the equation here, equation number one. And then I also copied down the boundary conditions and the initial conditions here. And then just for reference, I wrote some of the units in the upper right here. So we have the Young's modulus, mass over length times time squared, uh, the second uh, moment of area, which is uh, length to the fourth, and then obviously density. In this case, it was just mass over length. Um, and then our displacement or a, a kind of deflection of the beam, which is just a measure of length. And so to begin, basically I, you know, followed the routine of changing the variables. And so in this case, we have three variables that we want to change. We have essentially the X or the length along the beam, uh, which we can change to XC times some H. Uh, we want to change the time as well, and then we want to change our U, our deflection of the beam. And so to start, basically, you know, the key thing here is that we want to set three of our pi terms equal to one to solve for these three uh, characteristic length and, and time, of course. And so, you know, another kind of systematic thing we're doing here is we want to first change those derivatives. We want to non-dimensionalize them. And so since we have both a uh, you know, partial dx and partial dt, uh, basically we wanna change the x, the x to h, and then we wanna change the t to s. And since our dx, d, or, uh, our d dx uh, is to the fourth, basically we do that four times and we find that our uh, non-dimensional version is uh, you know, d to the fourth, dh to the fourth, and then one over dxc to the fourth. And then since our time is only to uh, you know, the second, uh, basically we just do that twice. And we similarly find that we have basically a d squared over ds squared, and then all times one over dc squared. Just to jump in for everybody, there's like a very small pedantic thing that I would say here, which is that you in general want to move the kind of constant term outside the derivative. So like this is your operator. You know, no one can see what I'm pointing at can't hear, maybe you can. Uh, this is your operator that's going to be your new kind of term that you're taking the derivative of. And this is kind of a constant that's multiplying it. So this almost looks like you're saying take the derivative of this thing, but this thing's a constant. It's a super small point, but just in terms of notational stuff, consistency, you want to do that. You know, I agree that that's much more clear to have both the one over xc to the fourth in front here and the one over tc squared in the front here. And so uh, moving, which I, I do later on, but moving forward, um, basically we're taking our change of variables, so equations two through four, as well as our, uh, you know, what we found for our non-dimensional derivatives, uh, equation five and six, and we're just gonna plug that into our original equation, equation number one. And so basically what we see from that is that we have a Young's modulus times the second uh, moment of area over um, uh, xc to the fourth. And then all of that, uh, this, this fourth uh, derivative is operating on our non-dimensional version of, of uh, u. And then similarly, we have this row over tc squared. 
and then kind of the second uh, best derivative operating on UCV. And then as far as moving forward into equation number eight, well, I just pulled out our, uh, you know, characteristic deflection, UC in both of these. And now we basically have effectively non-dimensionalized these partial derivatives. Um, and so the, these terms here are non-dimensional. And then uh, we kind of take a break from this equation number eight here, but we'll come back to it. And now we want to non-dimensionalize our boundary and initial conditions. And so basically the way that I like to think about it, just kind of looking at the notes and, and you know, maybe some people think about it differently. But basically, you know, we have this deflection equation that depends on X and T. And we want to basically turn that into a non-dimensional version, which, you know, in our earlier equations, we said that V and then H and S. And of course, this is the non-dimensional version of U, X and T. And so basically from there, you know, I'm just starting with our boundary conditions that are given. And then I'm kind of changing them into our non-dimensional versions. And so for what that looks like in terms of the deflection, basically we're trying to normalize this uh, initial deflection, this U naught, by the characteristic deflection. And then similarly for the, uh, the X, uh, you know, we're kind of normalizing, I like to think about it as, uh, but this becomes L over XC. And then for our initial conditions, although it doesn't give us a pi term, it's still good to show that when time is equal to zero, of course, our V will also be equal to zero, uh, much like the U was. And so basically from this, we're seeing that, you know, as kind of the rules we followed, we're setting these two pi terms that are circled in orange to one. And so from that, we already get our characteristic deflection and our characteristic length. Uh, UC just equals U naught, and then U, and then XC equals L. And so I, I usually like to write up a little something just to check in with myself. So basically, we automatically know what UC and XC are by our boundary conditions. And so this raises the question, you know, how can we manipulate equation number eight, which was uh, basically our non-dimensional version of the, the original equation, so that we can solve for the characteristic time by setting just one of these pi terms to one. And just one because we already have solved for two and we want to set three pi terms to one. And so now we can go back to our equation number eight. And you know, this is where the professor describes it as kind of not so much a science, but more of an art, uh, which I like that, that idea. And, um, and so first off, we can cancel out these characteristic uh, deflections. And then we're left with this equation here, equation number nine. And we can divide by the Young's modulus, uh, which basically, as a reminder, this second uh, moment of area, this I is uh, a length to the fourth. And this is also a length to the fourth. So basically dividing by E, we'll see that this first term becomes non-dimensional. And then similarly, you know, when we divide by E, we see that the second uh, kind of coefficient in front of this second derivative is also non-dimensional. And this is where, I mean, I was just kind of thinking about the problem a lot, but basically you'll see that we have a pi term that we can set to one that we can solve for our TC here. But also this equation can just be simply rewritten out as if, if like we flip these coefficients. So if we multiply everything by TC squared and then divide by rho, and then similarly on this side, we could multiply by XC to the fourth and divide by I, and then these would cancel and you know it kind of flips hopefully hopefully that's clear what's going on here um, but either way we find that our characteristic time is this square root of rho uh, divided by e and so my final conclusion here is that basically you know if we're looking at either equation 10 or equation 11 we might want to use these uh, depending on the problem and so basically, since we're setting this, this term that contains a t equal to one, uh, the, this term here, these two orange terms will, will fall away. And so what I said is that basically, you know, if we were dealing with long slender beams, then we would expect this, uh, you know, second uh, moment of area, this i divided by, as we found xc is equal to l, divided by the l squared. Uh, would approach zero, which would effectively get rid of this first derivative. I just put an epsilon in front. Um, but, you know, as a reminder, like the second moment of area is kind of like the cross-sectional area and uh, obviously the length of the beam. So this is sort of a long slender beam. And that's where you would see this first term fall away or just we could perturb it by some small epsilon. And then we'd be left with an equation just uh, uh, you know, second derivative of V with respect to S uh, equal to zero. 
And then if we look at equation number 11, well, this is basically going to be the opposite. And so now our, our equation that's going to zero is the length to the fourth divided by i. And so this is basically saying we have a short beam divided by some beam with a large cross-sectional area, so like a short stubby beam, for example. And you know we can set this whole thing equal to zero. And basically, we'd find that the fourth derivative stays, but the second derivative would fall away. And I, I just left an epsilon there so we could perturb it. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think uh, maybe you guys thought about it differently, but I was, I was thinking that's um, one way to look at it. Uh, um, okay. I have a question, just a quick question. So if you go back right. to your boundary conditions and initial conditions. Okay. What's that? Um, uh, yeah, actually, do you want to mute you and I'll switch over to this audio? Got it. I think now people can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. So the problem is that uh, one-dimensional like the problem is just the way that the resulting boundary conditions meet those non-dimensional groups. So I, uh, for t time scale, I set uh, one over omega as the time scale here because it appears in the boundary condition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, maybe I missed that boundary condition. Yeah, so if you go up, yep. yeah, so here you can kind of, oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, that should be, that should be. Here's a, another dimensionless screen. Oh, okay. Right? Oh, omega tau, which is another option. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this, um, do, does anyone want, do, would you want to come and, what is the result of that? Would you, oh. would you be interested? Um, let me just. Um, yeah, the thing where you have it. Sort of the point because I grouped it all in one non-dimensional group. Oh, yeah, that is an interesting point. All right, we're going to show this this other option. Yeah, you can show yours now. I will share mine. Thank you. Can I like go through my answer? Because sure. I yeah, work in a little different way. Totally. Let's see. It. I think this is really really helpful. Do you want to take a Thank you. Okay, so similar to what I saw, I set characters value x d p c u c and its own uh, its non-dimensional form x star t star u star like. I'm not a great fan of like <laughs> using so many parameters because it's it ends up making me like mixing everything up. So these are characteristic values, and the stars are non-dimensional. I should say that if you don't like to introduce new parameters, a very common way to do variable substitutions is to uh, replace your variable with a capital letter of the, of the uh, sorry, or start with a capital letter and then move to a lowercase letter. So that's a common thing like, for people who don't like to switch exactly. Okay. Or like, no, it would be more like little u is equal to uc times big u. Um, so you still end up with like a characteristic length and you see that there's like a temporary variable. Uh -huh. And then you end up multiplying that times instead of u star, it should be capital U. So, uh, so okay. your differential equation becomes like so, partial so derivative of mm -hmm. capital U over partial derivative of capital S or, mm -hmm. or capital T or something. So, mm -hmm. so it, that's just, you know. You can, <laughs> Okay, and we also have pressure thresholds. Can be rewritten as this way. Okay. 
Okay, let's put these things into the original equation. Then we get Just rewrite the whole equation with the, the non dimensional parameters I just said. Yeah, okay. So here, what stuff in my head was like we can just simply divide in the equation, whole equation by, oh, let's cancel out this first. We can get the non-dimensional groups by simply dividing the equation by one of these parameters here or here. But I want I wanted to think like if this equation was like mass and like hundreds of terms, it's not gonna happen. But let's say we have a really massive equation and we don't know how many non-dimensional groups we wanna end up having. So I was initially trying like maybe we can end up having like B as our non dimensional groups, but this is not true, right? Because we also have this. So it's embedded in this. So how can you avoid this kind of situation? I've been thinking about it. And I think we can use Buckingham High theorem here. So if you think about this problem as figuring out the dimensional relationship between B, I, rho, and PC, and XB, we can write down the relationship like this. And following the Buckingham High theorem as we did like in last homework, we end up having something like this. So we can rewrite this as this. And it seems from what I've learned. It seems there's only one pi group, but if we think about dividing E with this, we also have one more pi group. So first pi group is this, and the second pi group would be this. So we have four parameters and three fundamental dimensions. So we should end up having one, but why is it invalid here? Because we took E to form the non dimensional group. So we actually take the E into the function. So the better way of writing it is actually like this. So we also want to have E in our non dimensional group. So we end up having two pi groups, even before we like try several things to find out how many non-dimensional group we can have. So can I jump in for two things really quickly? So if the last thing that uh, was written about an f of all those parameters equals zero is confusing to people, what you could have done is said that the thing we want which is kind of uc mm -hmm. would be a function of all of those things. Mm -hmm. But we know that uc kind of goes away, but based on the fact that it's multiplying both terms, it's equal to zero. Uh, and so that might help people see, like, because we never really started by writing down uh -huh. f of something is equal to zero, but uh, it's okay. okay. It's correct, but it's correct because that uc term is multiplying all the terms on the left hand side, so it goes away. Okay, got it. The second thing is, uh, this is might be misleading uh, because we know that we have three uh, characteristic values and we would expect to have kind of three dimensionless quantities. 
And the reason we don't from Buckingham Pi here is because we left out the parameters that appear in the boundary conditions. Ah. So if you had added in the parameters that appear in the boundary conditions, you would have ended up with another pi group kind of omega over omega times ah, say, TC. Right, right. That's, that's where I'm missing the one over omega. Exactly. Ah, got and it. And that's where that would come in because the function would have all the terms in the governing equation and the boundary and initial condition. But your approach is right. It's just that's where, if you're kind of confused, that those are some things. Oh, that's a good thing. We should also have omega term here. Yeah. And we will end up having straight pi groups, mm -hmm. including this one, and this one, and so the third one. Should be like TC omega, I think. Yeah. Great. Okay, so let's rewrite the boundary condition and initial condition. So just same as before, putting everything back to the original boundary condition and initial condition. Just cancel out the character to the constant. Mm -hmm. And by looking at it, we have first hybrid here. Step to one. And the second hybrid here. S1. So we end up having characteristic deformation equals to initial deformation. So setting to deformation. Yeah, anyway, you know. And characteristic time scale, so the one over omega. And the characteristic, oh, yeah. And characteristic length scale of the beam as L. So we can uh, rewrite the equation here by substituting this into that. We end up having And the boundary conditions depends so I'm running out of the space. The initial uh, condition should be remain the same. Uh, omega squared for redundant set. E over rho omega squared. Very good. Right? Max modulus is not so good for like times squared. It should be squared. Yeah, I think you had it up above. Oh, yeah, yeah, I think I just missed it. Yeah, 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 just missed it. yeah. Okay, awesome. So, I, I guess I want to thank you. Um, so, both of these are correct. And so, I don't want to, I'm kind of glad that we got to do this. 
because they're both different ways that we can non-dimensionalize the problem. The only thing I would say on this last one is if we can collect these terms together into some sort of epsilon term, I think that would be useful for what we're going to do going forward, which is looking at these kind of perturbation methods to approximate solutions. These are two different ways to set up this problem. And why would you want two different ways to set up this problem? Well, uh, the first problem that was presented is what you would use to model something like uh, uh, the free vibrations of a diving board. You jump off a diving board, the diving board is going to kind of go up and down and then kind of decay. We're ignoring the decay term, so we're kind of saying it would just vibrate forever. But the question would be like, well, what's the frequency it's going to vibrate at? You know, I just kind of loaded this thing, I just jumped on it once, and then it just kind of vibrates and it comes back. The second problem is the way this one is, is done is such that you're actually driving that cantilever or driving that beam. This would be the case of something like a modeling um, an atomic force microscope. The atomic force microscope, what they do is they take a, like a little cantilever. Oh, wow, there's a cantilever right here. It's incredible. Um, um, so they take a little can. So this is the first problem, right? It's like it's the second problem, the one that I was asking for in the, in the homework is this is like pretend this is a can, uh, an atomic force microscope tip, an AFM tip. So you have like a really sharp kind of crystalline uh, diamond tip over here. And you kind of use this to walk across the surface. You would kind of do like this. And you don't actually touch the surface, you just kind of vibrate above it. And then you have a laser that comes down and kind of measures like the reflection of that tip. Um, so it's got like a little sensor here, laser shoots, hits it, and then you kind of see where that laser point moves. And that tells you what the topography of the surface you're kind of driving over looks like. So in that case, there is no free vibration of that of that tip. You're, you're forcing it to vibrate at some frequency. You set a frequency, maybe you set that frequency based on kind of like the, the amount of samples you want to take on there. So in that case, like the free vibrations don't really matter. So you're not really looking at the first problem. What you're really concerned with is kind of like, how is this thing bending relative to how fast I'm driving it? There are two different problems that lead to two different ways that you would non-dimensionalize them, set them up and solve them. And it depends on kind of the physics of the problem that you're after. So I'm glad we have to do this because the, the first one is not wrong. It's just modeling a different, a different phenomenon. If, if we're driving it, shouldn't there be a term on, um, in the original partial differential equation, should there be a term on the right hand side? You're forcing it occurring at the, at the boundary, right? So you're forcing it not in the bulk. We are forcing it out of particular out of space. So the, the forcing term appears kind of in the sinusoidal uh, deflection of the boundary. So you're imposing a deflection with a particular time scale at the boundary. And so that kind of imposed deflection, it's, uh, it's kind of what you would call a displacement control instead of force control. Oh, it's, a, oh, oh, it's not a actual condition. It's not an initial condition. It's a it's a boundary condition in which you're imposing the deflection. Um, so if it was an impulse, so if it was an impulse, then you would have. Um, if it was an impulse, then it would be an initial condition. Correct. The way it's set up right now means it's sort of a time dependent force at the boundary, and if you had some sort of deflection function across the entire. Uh, being that in that case, it would be it would be on the right hand side. Yeah. So I'll just repeat that in case people couldn't hear. So I will correct it just a, a tiny bit in which that it's not a force. Can, you're not doing a imposed force at the boundary. You're imposing a deflection. Now there will be a reaction force yeah. because of that. But yes, you're imposing a, a a deflection at the boundary. If you were actually saying I would like to impose a deflection along the curve everywhere kind of spatially along x, that would appear on the, in the governing differential equation because now you're going to be having a variation in maybe the deflection over x. Here you're saying at one point, I'm imposing a deflection. The beam's going to deflect, and we can figure out what that's going to be everywhere else, but I'm only imposing a deflection at, say, whatever we called it, u at the, at the boundary. At x, is, I forget if it was x is 0 or x is l, but yes. So, and then you're correct, like if we were doing a, an impulse that's going to appear as an initial condition. And if we were doing something in which we were imposing the deflection of the entire thing, so maybe giving it like a uniform deflection 
um, or some sort of comp it really wouldn't be uniform. It'd have to be something like uh, parabolic or something so that the deflection at one fixed end is zero. Um, in that case, it would appear in the governing differential equation. Slightly tangential question. Uh, would this, is this partial differential equation valid for um, other elasticity problems, or is this specifically just beam deflection? Or beam deflection? Sorry. This is beam deflection. If you wanted to do plate deflection, you would end up with a Laplacian for your time derivative, and you'd end up with a bi-Laplacian or bi-harmonic for your spatial derivative. So instead of being partial derivative, you would end up with like a, you know, what is it, nabla, the upside down triangle to the fourth, in which you're basically saying I'm going to have deflections in X or Y. If you want to go into shells, it's more complicated than that. You have to think about, we'll talk about shells later. So there's, it's, it's not, it's not simply saying the down to the fourth uh, extends to three dimensions. In that I'm yeah so the, I, in that case I was I was taking Dell as the two dimensional operator for the plates but then you could also look at uh, the more complicated three dimensional one but I, that's a little bit um, yeah that that one doesn't extend as, as cleanly but the this problem doesn't do so look we did a cantilever beam so we did like a diving board but this is not the equation for instance to uh, model the vibrations of a guitar string because the guitar string is going to have some in-plane tension here and so you know you tighten you tune your guitar knob and it makes the string tighter the sound that it makes is going to be dependent on how tight that you make that string so that would be another force term that would have to do with not the out-of-plane deflection but the in-plane stretching of the fill to arm and that would be added there so and if you remove the inertial term then you end up with the static equation or the Bernoulli beam that we're all used to. There are other variants on this. It depends on the kind of physics of the problem. If you have the short stubby beam case, you have to worry about other things that you might remember from mechanics and materials, like the transverse shear stress in that beam. That would uh, kind of appear as another uh, term in the, in the governing equation. So these are all, you know, you kind of start to see how, like, you can kind of add on the physics that you need for the problem that you're interested in. These characteristic time scales are important though. Characteristic length scale makes sense, right? It's like how much are you deflecting relative to the beam length? The characteristic time scale, that is a really, the top one that was done in the first uh, case is like the this time it takes an elastic wave to propagate through a material. So you end up with the square root of rho over E. How fast will a wave propagate through this material? It depends on the density and the elastic modulus. And here we have a time scale that's basically saying, how fast am I driving this thing? And so you end up with different physical problems due to that. Other questions? This is a kind of um, off topic question, but would apply to all of the um, problems. Um, so I had originally misread the, the problem, so I tried to do it this way and it didn't work anyway. But do you have to take all the variables, both dependent, independent, and introduce a characteristic value or could you do like only two of the three for example and end up with a different way different kind of problem yeah so this is a good question i think this one will become more clear when we do problem two but you yeah the answer is yes you take all the variables independent or dependent and replace them with a characteristic value now you have to be careful there because in the next problem we have a couple parameters in there that are not the independent or dependent variables in the parameter. In particular, I'm thinking of that lowercase b term. That b term is not an independent parameter. We're not taking derivatives with respect to it. And it's not, it's not a dependent parameter. It's not what we're saying. It's, it's a constant. And so it does not depend on x or t. And so it doesn't kind of appear as an independent or, or dependent variable. So that one, we don't introduce a characteristic value for because it's not a variable, it's a parameter. It's going to kind of shift your curve up or down, but it's not going to, um, you don't have to consider how changing space or time affects that parameter because it's a constant, right? And it's a parameter in that problem. All of the terms that, that are kind of your independent or dependent variables, the independent variables, at least in the case of a, of a differential equation, are going to appear, that's what you're taking derivatives with respect to. 
And independent variables are usually the terms you're actually differentiating with respect to those independent variables. And in all those cases, those are the ones that you need to introduce characteristic uh, values for. Does that help? Yeah, it does. By your statement of then for all, would that mean that, because obviously I didn't do this then, that the theta in the next problem, although it's dimensionless, would still need to be characterized because we're taking derivatives with it? Yeah, exactly. There's okay. still need some characteristic kind of uh, rotation uh, apparent. Even though it's a dimensionless term, it's kind of like, how, think of it this way, you know, how do we know if, uh, that angle uh, depends on, I think it's space or time, and how do we know the magnitude of that angle relative to something in the problem? And that the introduction of a characteristic variable is allowing us to say, oh, okay, the angle is um, small compared to these things that, that are the parameters of the problem, or large uh, compared to, to these things, or set by something in the initial conditions. Um, so yes, even though it's dimensionless, which is kind of confusing, the, the, the introduction of these characteristic values helps us not dimensionalize the equations, but then also helps us kind of estimate the order of magnitude of the terms in our equations, which is important for kind of how we learn how to approximate them. Okay, thank you. Other questions on problem one? And while people are dreaming up questions, if anyone is willing to volunteer to do problem two. Um, I can do it. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Can you, who actually just said that? <laughs> Sorry. Alita, A L Y D A. Thank you. Sorry, I couldn't. It's hard for me to keep track. Um, co host, there we go. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen on the iPad. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay. So this is problem two. So it's basically giving us the equation for a relativistic motion of a planet around the sun. So that was that was d squared r d t squared minus r. Let me just write out the equation. And they're telling us that b is a constant. And then we have the initial conditions. R at T equals zero equals R not theta T equals zero equals zero. And then also, what was the other condition? I am, and then DR, dt uh, t equals zero equals zero. Okay, so then what I did first was just kind of, they asked you what are the uh, units or dimensions of our what exactly is that of R and B. Um, so just kind of doing some reasoning here. Um, like for example, you can just look at this term uh, right here. You can just look at this term right here and you can like know just from familiarity that G is a gravitational constant which has units of 
um, meters cubed over kilograms times seconds squared. And then you also know that mass is, that M is mass, which is kilograms. And then you can kind of also just reason that R is radius, which is meters. Um, so if you kind of just multiply these together, um, you end up getting meters per second squared. So then you basically know that all these terms, like right here, all have to have these units, meters per second squared, because they have to match. So then from this, you end up getting that R has units of length, which it can be like meters, and then B has units of length to the fourth over T squared, which is meters squared over meters to the fourth over second squared. So that's part A. And then part B is just non-dimensionize and scale, choose your scaling so that only dimension, the only non-dimensional group appearing involves B. Okay, so we're gonna first let R, we're gonna have their characteristic variables, which is gonna be R, T, and theta, because those are the three things that you're bearing in this problem and the rest of them are constants. So an R is gonna be R, C, R star. I use stars because it's just easier for me to keep track of what corresponds to what. And then theta equals theta C, theta. And then just for me to reference later on, T star equals T over TC and theta star equals theta over theta C. Okay, so we're, the way that I do this is a little different from other people um, that I've seen. So I'll kind of try to explain my reasoning. But basically you want to sub in R, T and theta in these forms into your original equation. So you're gonna end up with d squared r c r star d t c t star squared r c r star. I'm just gonna write the rest of this out. Okay, now we're gonna expand this. So over here on the left, you end up with R, C, D squared, R star. And then the bottom you end up with T, C squared, D, T star. So the way I do it is like basically you apply this to you apply this to this, but you don't apply it to this because it's a constant. So you just take it out. And then this squared is technically like you're squaring everything inside this parentheses right here. Um, this should also have a square here. So and that's why this ends up looking like this. And then minus R C R star. Let me do the same thing here. Let me actually write this in a better format. Okay, then you end up with this whole equation. So the goal is to make everything non-dimensional, right? So you have this right here, you have this right here, this right here, and 
this right here, right? And you want to non-dimensionalize all those. So you could do just like very quickly, just like pick out these things and see, okay, what like units do I have right now? So for example, if I look at this, this currently has units over M of M over S squared, which means that I have to end up multiplying this last term by something that has units S squared over M. So, and if you look over here um, to the left, you see that this has units um, uh, M over S squared. But then if you were to multiply the whole equation by its inverse, that means that by moving this all to the right, you would actually non-dimensionalize all these different highlighted groups. So then you multiply everything by TC squared over RC. And then you end up with C squared R star. Okay, so now from here, we're gonna pick out our pi groups. So we have this as one of our pi groups. We have this as another pi group. And then we have this as another pi group, right? So you're basically picking out whatever groups of like constants you have that, are not, that you did not dimensionalize that do not include these star terms because those are your non-dimensionalized versions of your variables. So those are the three that we have. So we have three pi groups here. Okay, but now we have to non-dimensionalize our initial conditions and bounded conditions as well. So we had our t equals zero equals r naught. And the way I do this is like, I kind of thought it in a similar way as somebody, like the previous person explained it, but a little different. It's like, you're trying to non-dimensionalize this whole thing, right? So you're gonna divide it by your characteristic variable, because if you divide everything by characteristic variables, then it, you're gonna end up kind of canceling out that unit that these variables have. Uh, with them, right? So you're going to end up with also a non-dimensionalized form of them. So you're going to do R over RC, TC, and RC, which gives us this. So that's why I wrote things out like this over here, just to like help me quickly reference these right there and then let me just write out all these so you end up with dr t then you do error the same thing to all of them so it's going to be rc tc tc Data C. Oh, sorry. This actually was not supposed to be here. This is just that. And then you do data C. T C. And then these give you this. So if you look at these initial conditions, um, all these have just like T star terms, like these two last ones right here. So you can't pick out any pi groups from here. But if you look at the first one, you have this one non-dimensionalized group um, that you can also uh, pick out as a pi group. 
So we have pi four. So now that we did that, we can apply our rule one, which states that basically set all your pi groups and your initial and boundary conditions equals to one. So we only have one. So then that gives us RC equals R none. And then your rule two states, choose your pi groups from your equation in a sense from the like reduced form equation um, that will make basically your problem simpler, right? But then we also have to remember that in the problem statement, it's telling us to choose your scaling so only the only non-dimensional group appearing involves B. So if we look back at our equation, we have this. No, I'm just not gonna write it out. We have this right here. And you have to choose the first pi group because it's the only one that has theta c. So you, and you have to solve for theta c, right? So like by process elimination, you have to choose that one. And then now you're between choosing that second and third pi group. So if you want to, since it says to choose so that the only non-dimensional group appearing involves B, that's why I chose pi three because the only one that has B, but I might have also interpreted that part of the problem statement wrong. But I ended up choosing pi one and pi three. So on pi one, gives you that theta c equals plus or negative one, and then pi two gives you that tc equals r naught squared over plus or negative squared b. So you have all your three characteristic variables now defined. And the last step that you have to do is just plug in these into your equation and into your initial conditions. So when you end up plugging those into your equation, you end up getting this and then your initial conditions, your non-dimensionalized initial conditions become these. As you can see, we replace this with one because we are going with the assumption that our pi group over here is equal to one. So that's why this is equal to one now. Um, yeah, and that is what I got. Excellent, thank you, that was really clear. Um, questions? Yeah? Uh, I actually didn't get a, a theta star because it's already non-dimensional. But is there a certain like a situation where setting this uh, theta star is like uh, useful? Yeah, no, I, th I think it's important to because you, you remember that one of the first goals that we're trying to to do is to figure out like what the characteristic scales in the problem are, and so by saying that theta c is equal to one. What you're really saying is that that kind of angular momentum term, that second term there, is important and can't be neglected. And we know it's important because the prefactor is of order one. And if the prefactor is order one, then, then this is not a small parameter that we can just kind of wash our hands with and reduce this to um, maybe a simpler ODE. And so the, one of the initial or early goals in this process is to, you know, uh, 
obviously it's non-dimensional has a problem, but then the next step is we we don't want to leave kind of unknowns in our problem. Because if you show that to someone and say, okay, what's the data C? And you're like, I don't know. We're saying, okay, based on how we're setting up this problem, theta C, setting theta C equal to one is, a, is effectively a way of saying this term is important and cannot be neglected. Otherwise, we can't properly model our, uh, the, this, this phenomenon. Yep. Yeah, so I mean, I also didn't uh, non dimensionalize data, but um, uh, I, I'm just more curious in like a general sense. So, why are we not really um, like there's two uh, uh, equations given, like 2a and 2b? Um, and I think that it, at least I kind of went through that process. Again, I didn't non dimensionalize data, so I'm unsure. Um, but I think that if you did that, there would be an option to have like the characteristic theta in terms of the characteristic R and, and T, maybe. I mean, because there's like an R there and then the derivative is like equation 2B in the problem statement. Uh, so instead of setting it equal to one, you're saying you have kind of two appearances of theta C. Yeah. And then you can uh, derive. So did you, uh, you say you didn't, I, I, I didn't did anyone else uh, yeah, use the second that. equation to figure out the characteristic length of theta c? Or characteristic magnitude, I should say. Yeah, I forget what happens when you go through that process. But yeah, I, I think you're, it's, uh, it's, um, I can't remember if that second condition is just the initial condition over here. What is the second equation? Remind me. Uh, it is this ddt of r squared d theta dt equals zero. Ah, okay. Um, I worked that out with the chain rule actually, and I ended up just with a theta c left on its own as well. So you end up with theta c equals one again, because you end up with an rc squared over tc squared on both of them. So those kind of cancel out and you end up with a theta c on its own, similar to how you had a theta c squared on its own in the first equation. Yeah. My recollection of this is that you, you don't gain in, intuition other than that the theta c term has to be of order one. But it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. Yeah. The only other thing I, I, I think I might have maybe worded the, the question not as clearly, but I was in, I think I was intending pi, see if you can scroll up, I think I was intending pi two to be set to one. I think that's what you've written there, but it's, I think you actually did pi three, um, which just changes the nature of the problem. It's basically a way of saying, is B a small parameter or not? Like, what's the small parameter? And so by, in this way, as written, it's kind of implying that like, this is a small parameter, um, which, you know, this is a, what is it? It's a relativistic motion of a planet around the sun, the gravitational constant and mass, they're gonna be pretty large values. This B term, I forget exactly what it physically represents, but I think I was looking for the opposite, which would be, instead of this being pi two, this is actually pi three, just from your notation up there. Um, and I had set pi two equal to one, and had my small parameter. So I had this be kind of order one, and then my epsilon term multiplying one over the radius cubed. Again, it's a different nature of the problem. I think for, for the sake of um, what this was set up for, I think B is small. And so this would be really large. So, it, but, but the, the proceed, overall procedure was really good, so. So if you have like pi two equal to one, mm -hmm. and if you have the the t and r naught over b to the the second term, like vice versa, as you said, so we end up having like b over g and rho naught times the the second term. My thought, I'm not, so my thought was you take the pi group two up there and set that equal to one and solve for uh, tc squared, TC squared yeah. and then plug in tc squared into pi three. Right, 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 right. And that would leave you with like your epsilon term would be the, 
the whatever pi three is once you substitute in RC and TC. RC being R naught, TC being like the square root of GM over R naught cubed. Can you repeat it like, uh, why is, why does that mean that in this form of equation, the first term is small? It doesn't mean that this first term is small. I'm saying I probably should have made it more clear that I that B is a small number. And based on the problem of like relative relativistic motion of a planet around the sun, like G is not small and M is not small. And so big number over small number is going to leave with a huge number. And what I was looking for was that you would have something with B in the numerator over G and M in the denominator. And I, and I should have made it more clear that it says B is small, then the term multiplying this thing here would be a small parameter. And then you could kind of go and see how this solution varies. So you could set up something equal to zero and you're going to get a more classical kind of angular momentum gravitational problem. And then now you're getting this nonlinear term, which I think appears due to relativistic motion. I also have another question, which is slightly off from what you said here. Why don't we have one more initial condition for A? You sort of do. It's in the, uh, oh, it went away. If you scroll down here, the last equation that worked out ends up being a, another equation that allows you to solve for theta. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so, so in this equation, it's definitely very good to be so B. Need one more initial condition for theta. That's a good point. Well, that I don't know. That's a good point. Yeah, so we actually have a second derivative theta here. That's a good question. I don't know. Maybe I, I don't know if I either left something out or if. Yeah, I don't know. I'll look into that. I'll, I'll check out and see what's missing there. Yeah, thank you. Good one. I have another question going back to like finding the reduced problem and determining what's big and, and what's small. Mm -hmm. I thought in class the other day you said that when you are looking for the reduced problem, you either throw away the pi groups that are really, really large or really, really small. So you were saying how like G um, and M and R, those are all large because we're talking about planets. So could you argue that those are so large that you get rid of them? Or in this case, is it like that's the scale of the problem and like the order of magnitude of the problem? So with respect to the problem, they're not large? I guess I'm just kind of confused. Yeah, sure. that's a great, yeah. That's a great question. So um, one way to, to resolve this and think about it, and I think we talked about this um, uh, and one of the example problems we did, but you don't want to throw away a term that throws out some of the crucial physics of the problem. So if we throw out this term here for being large or small, then no, we no longer have the gravitational constant in the problem. We no longer have uh, a way of determining how gravity is causing this kind of uh, celestial body rotation. And so I think the, the concept of the reduced problem is really confusing and I haven't found a better way of articulating it other than to say, you know, how, can, what term can you throw away without kind of completely changing the problem and losing all of the kind of the, the physics you were trying to model in the first place. So if we had kept this and thrown away this term, we still have like a, you know, angular momentum gravitational problem at our hands. But if we throw out this term, then we kind of lose the, the physics that we're, we set out to model. And I don't know how to articulate that. It's a little bit tricky to, and that's kind of what I mean by the reduced problem. I, I think that's what people mean when they write about this is they're, they're essentially saying like, you know, what are the, the bare minimum ingredients you need for this model to kind of be describing the phenomena that you're interested in? And if we throw out gravity, we lose kind of one of the crucial ingredients. Does that help at all? I know it's not as clear cut as I would like, but 
that actually makes a lot more sense than just if it's a really big value or really small value. Yeah. So that helped a lot. Thank you. No problem. All right. Well, thank you for presenting that one, Alita. Um, anyone interested in doing problem number three? The heat transfer one, I think. I can do problem three. Awesome. Uh, sorry, I'm so bad. Susan? Cool. Um, Co-host. Awesome. Should be sharing. Sorry for the the bad scan quality. I am still trying to figure out a good way to scan things. Um, but so up here um, is the equation. Um, it's a sort of temperature with respect to time, and I just wrote out everything in the problem statement. Um, so the first question was the dimensions of k, q, and theta, which are all constants in the problem. Um, so looking first at theta. If you look up at the equation, it, there's an exponent of theta over t. And so since there really shouldn't be a dimension in the exponent, theta must have the same dimension as t, t being temperature. So it would have the dimensions of theta or temperature. Um, Q then, for this one, I said, since there's a summation or really a difference between two different parameters, each one has to have the same dimensions as the de derivative of temperature with respect to time. Um, so Q, because E is dimensionless, must have the same dimensions as the derivative of temperature with respect to time. So it would be um, temperature of theta times T to the negative one. Um, and then the same concept applies for the, the, the K value, but we also have this mul multiplication with temperature. Um, but that full value would have to be the same dimensions as the derivative of temperature with respect to time. So since temperature is temperature, K is just time to the negative one. Um, the next part is to non-dimensionalize the problem and then choose your scale such that the heat loss term is large compared with the heat generated by the reaction. So the only two um, independent slash dependent variables in this problem are temperature and time. So those are the two characteristic values that I introduced. Um, so I started with just substituting that into the original equation. Um, so we have, this is the original equation and then substituting it in um, as people have already explained how, to, how, that, how that is done, taking this one over TC out um, to represent the um, non-dimensionalization of the derivative with respect to temperature um, and then kind of taking everything out um, so you be missing a, a mass uh, next to the, the derivative term on the left hand side of that equation. I think it should be DMDS. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I realized it's on the rewriting. Um, Thank you. Sorry. It looks like it wasn't there. Um, yeah, so this is temperature over time because that all comes out and then DMDS. Yep. Sorry, you're, you're sure. right. That, that's missing. Um, so this then um, to non-dimensionalize, I kind of looked at just basically each term and said, well, this term is temperature over time. This one's time to the negative one. So kind of what does it need to become non-dimensionalized? Um, and I found that by just dividing through on this, um, everything ended up non-dimensionalized. Um, so I uh, just divided, divided through um, the temperature over time, both of those characteristic values. And I ended up with dm over ds is equal to uh, characteristic temp time over characteristic temperature times q. Um, so that's going to be one of my dimensionless parameters. Um, and then I have um, theta over tcm minus tck um, m and then tf over tc. Um, and then I also changed my initial condition to be m of zero is t naught over tc in the same concept as has been explained in previous problems. Um, I then just for my own, like kind of to, to gather them all together, wrote out all my dimensionless groups, whether they were gonna be set to zero or one. Um, I just wanted them all kind of in the same place. 
So the first one's very obvious. T naught over TC is going to be a, a pi group. Um, that one's going to definitely be equal to one because it is in the initial conditions. Um, but then looking at this problem up here, we, we have this TC over TC times Q. Um, we have a pi group up in the uh, exponent of the of E. Um, and then we have TC times K as the uh, coefficient of this term, and then Tf over Tc at the back. So looking at these five groups, we only have two um, characteristic values. So obviously not all of these are going to be included. Um, so the first rule is that the boundary condition set that equal to one. So that one is very straightforward. T naught over Tc is one, or Tc is simply your, the initial temperature of uh, the substance. Um, so we need one more dimensionless group and it was stated in the problem to assume that the heat loss term is much greater than the heat generated by the reaction. Um, and assuming that I understood correctly which one was which, I said that heat generation was the first term and heat loss was the second term. Um, and so heat, since heat generation is so much less, that one kind of goes to zero. Um, and your heat loss term is what you look at to set equal to one. Um, so what I said is that, you know, this full, this um, coefficient would be equal to one, which makes your characteristic time equal to one over K. Um, so this was an extra scan because once again, I'm apparently not that good at scanning. Um, but if you take those characteristic time and temperature in and put them back into the equation, um, this is what I ended up getting with everything kind of plugged in and then I simplified it out. Um, and then since we had already stated that, um, Sorry, this, this should say heat generation, but this first term is much smaller in comparison with the second term, um, which was stated in the assumptions. So I added an epsilon there um, to kind of show that assumption. Awesome, great questions. That was really clear. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, you you could you could typically wrap Q into that yes. whole non-dimensional term, so that way your your kind of small parameter is like everything. It's your small parameter is both dimensionless and like kind of all the parameters that are multiplied applying that term are, are wrapped into one. So yeah, you could wrap in, you could kind of pull epsilon and make it kind of Q over K T naught. Um, but yeah. No, 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 you really want to, generally you'd want to do, do that because your idea would be to say, okay, now my small parameter is epsilon, now let's take epsilon to, to zero, but then you want to say, well, let's take epsilon to a really small number, but then you have to take, well, then what am I going to use for Q? And then you, and then what does that mean? And so it's better to kind of wrap all those into one and you're saying that product, that dimensionless product has is a small magnitude, a number of small magnitudes. Do you typically wrap that in there? I have another question about the reduced problem for this one. Mm -hmm. Susan, if you could go up to where you like removed the heat generation. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, like uh, a little more. A little lower, sorry. I'm just, oh yeah. So I guess when you assume that the heat generation is really small, so that like first pi group um goes to zero and completely eliminates that first term um then you have that like tc times k m minus tftc and like intuitively you kind of know you need to use the tc times k because you already know your your big tc um so you're like looking for what your characteristic time is but i guess my question is like if that's the reduced problem um you still have two pi groups in there. So would you technically need to like justify why the second pi group is like either really big or not important? Or can you just say that I already solved for my temperature, like my characteristic temperature. So I don't need that pi term at the end. Yeah, exactly. The second part is the, is the correct way to think of it where you don't actually have a characteristic uh time anymore you know it's t or is it temperature you we well, don't have tc anymore you know it's t naught so i think susan could have replaced that in there um and so then you're the only thing you're left with is what is tc 
and then you have TC times K is t multiplied by two numbers that are you're taking the difference between. M is dimensionless, so it's a number. TF over T naught is dimensionless, so it's a number. And so you're just saying, well, then I, I want to make sure that no matter what, this term doesn't go away. So my characteristic time times K should be of order one. And so you say, okay, then TC uh, K is equal to one. And so, yeah, you're, the second way you described it is the correct way to think about it. Okay, thank you. Excellent. Any other questions on this one? All right, pretty good. Nice, thank you very much. Um, what's the last one? I actually forget what the last one is. It's the... What's that? So rocket, yeah, going back to projectiles, but instead of throwing them, using propulsion. So it sounds a little bit more involved. Anyone interested in going to do this one? I could do it. Uh, awesome, thank you. This is Jacob, by the way. All right, thanks, Jacob. All right. You should be able to scare, share your screen now. You guys see that? Mm -hmm. and can you hear me too? Yes. Cool. All right, it's a little bit weird talking into Zoom, so just gotta make sure. Um, all right, so yeah, uh, this problem, uh, like you said, is about rocket propulsion. So uh, we sort of have two governing equations. So we have d squared x over dt squared equals uh, alpha beta over m minus g over one plus x over r squared. Um, and then we also have the time derivative of m equals negative alpha. Uh, and then we have our initial conditions. Uh, we know that uh, the position and the velocity of the rocket uh, at time equals zero is zero. Um, and then we also know that the initial mass of the rocket is capital M. Um, so let's see, let me just look over the problem statement real fast, just to remind myself. Yeah, so, okay. So uh, the next thing I did is I just went through all the parameters and variables in the problem and just wrote out their dimensions just uh, to have as a check for myself. So we know that X is length, T is time, M is mass, Capital M is also mass. Alpha is mass over time, so that's like a mass flow rate. Uh, beta is a relative velocity, so it's length over time. G is gravity, so that's length over time squared. And then R is length. Um, so now we're gonna do the change of variables. So we've got our, uh, let's see, we have, yeah, M and X are our two uh, dependent variables. So we have M equals MC and I chose V to represent that. Uh, X equals XCU and T equals TCS. And then in the problem, we have a D DT term and we also have a D squared DT term. So just for reference, I wrote out uh, D DT equals one over TC DDS and D squared DT squared equals one over TC squared d squared ds squared. Um, so now all we need to do is plug these uh, changed non-dimensionalized variables into the problem. Um, and I realized that this bottom part did not scan very well, but I will uh, do my best to just say it out loud. Um, so we end up having that uh, the characteristic length x over tc squared times d squared u ds squared 
equals alpha beta over mc times one over v, which is our non-dimensionalized mass, um, minus g over one plus xc over r times our non-dimensionalized u, that whole quantity squared. Um, and then I noticed a pattern uh, from the last few problems where if you take the inverse of this uh, constant term multiplying your highest order derivative, usually if you take that inverse and multiply it by the rest of the problem, that will help you fully non-dimensionalize your problem. And in this problem, it worked out that that worked. So we multiplied the entire equation by TC squared over XC, and we end up getting our non-dimensionalized uh, first governing equation, which is D squared U over DS squared equals alpha beta TC squared over MC XC times one over V minus G TC squared over XC divided by the quantity one plus XC over R times U and that's squared. Um, and then we can, uh, in the meantime, while we're here, we have three pi groups. So we have our pi group multiplying the one over V term. We have our pi group in the numerator of the uh, second term on the right hand side. And then our pi group uh, in this nonlinearity here, so XC over R. <clears throat> Um, so then we can look at our second governing equation, which going back to the top, we know is dm dt equals negative alpha. Um, so using this format for ddt, uh, we know that dm dt equals mc over tc dv ds, which equals negative alpha. Um, let's see. So yeah, so then dv ds equals negative alpha times tc over mc, and that's another pi group, um, pi four. And then we go to our initial conditions. Um, so we know that for our spatial initial conditions, since they equal zero, then all of the uh, constant terms multiplying these non-dimensionalized variables are gonna cancel out because they equal zero. So we know that u at zero and the non-dimensionalized time derivative of u at time zero equals zero. Um, and then we have our uh, mass initial condition, which is that the initial mass time equals zero equals big M. Um, so we know that uh, mass equals mc times v. So v at time zero equals big M over our characteristic mass mc. Um, and then using rule one, this is the only pi group in our initial conditions. So using rule one setting pi five equal to one, we get that uh, MC, our characteristic mass is big M, our, our initial mass. Um, so now uh, rule two, we have to figure out which pi groups in our governing equations to set equal to one. Um, and our problem says that uh, acceleration is primarily due to fuel burning and the gravitational force is relatively small. So uh, the only pi groups that have to do with fuel burning are pi four and pi one. Pi four has the mass flow rate and uh, characteristic mass of the rocket and pi one has um, mass of the rocket, uh, mass flow rate and the relative velocity of the rocket um, as the gas is expelled downward. So, so we know that we're going to set pi 1 and pi 4 equal to 1. When we do that, we get that uh, pi 4 is alpha TC over MC equals 1. So our characteristic time is going to equal big M over alpha. And then pi 1, we've got this whole big term here equals 1. So then we get that XC equals big M beta over alpha. Uh, and then we can just plug this all back into our initial equation, our initial governing equations, and we get that d squared u ds squared equals one over v minus this term g big M over alpha beta all over the quantity one plus m beta over r alpha times u squared. And then our other uh, governing equation is dv over ds equals negative one by rule two. 
And then of course, um, you can set either of these resulting uh, non-dimensional groups to epsilon, depending on how you want to uh, look at your problem. Excellent. Qu uh, questions? Do people do this the same way? You can clearly see that the relative length scale of your problem changes in this propulsion version of the projectile than in the, uh, project than the projectile version where you used to be comparing the distance between X and the radius of Earth, but now it's really understanding the kind of, uh, kind of amount of fuel you have relative to how fast you're going and how fast you're burning uh, that fuel. And so kind of the characteristic, uh, at least one of the main characteristic uh, parameters of this problem changes uh, when you're kind of forcing uh, the acceleration versus kind of trying to resist the acceleration due to gravity. Yeah, question? Yeah, a very subtle thing that I was curious about, and it's kind of obvious in this case, but I'm more curious from the general sense. So basically, you know, when you're setting your, um, when you're solving for TC by setting alpha TC over MC equal to one, uh, I think you called it pi four mm -hmm. stuff a little bit. Uh, there is a minus one in front of there, um, uh, which you know obviously time is not going to be negative in this case. But more generally speaking, do you ignore like a constant number in front of the pi term, or do you group that in? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, typically, what you'll see, and this was done, I think, in the last one. I think, I think Susan did this as well. And, and typically, both the way this was this was done is the way you'll see it, which is you kind of take the parameters and the uh, that that are in the problem, create your pi group from that to figure out what the characteristic values are, and then leave the sign as kind of part of the uh, equation that you're going to end up with. And that's more for like intuition side of things, where you, you don't want to like pack a negative sign yeah. in your characteristic value because then it seems like you're adding. Then it seems like you're kind of saying like, oh, it's kind of like one over b plus this gravitational term, yeah. and kind of conceptually that can be tricky. So typically, what is done is what's been done here in the last problem, which is you just kind of leave the signs and you're just looking at the ratio of the parameters, and you're, and you're kind of saying my epsilon is going from zero to some positive number, okay. and then I might be either adding or subtracting that epsilon, but the um, yeah that that kind of appears in the equation and that's I think for me that's more for like how I can look at equation and quickly and intuit, intuit what's happening. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Are people feeling better about this homework assignment now that they've seen others go through it? Is it answering various questions? This is a practice kind of thing that there's really you, know, you kind of have to work out these things enough times to get a, a feel for it. But that question that keeps coming up of like, what is the reduced problem? Maybe the best way I can frame it is kind of like, what is essential? What is essential to this problem? And the challenging part there, I think, is that it requires you to dig a little bit deeper into what is this equation actually doing. The nice thing is, you're rarely going to, in your research career, going to be just like handed a set of differential equations that you have to like non-dimensionalize. Typically, you're going to kind of know pretty well all the magnitudes of the parameters in your problem and all the, you're going to know that like, okay, I know that this thing is going to be really easy to bend. And so that's going to be, you know, a small parameter is going to penalize how, how expensive it is to bend this thing. You're going to usually have a good intuition for it. So the problem that we saw with the gravitational problem where you're kind of like, I don't really know what the reduced problem is. That's more of an issue here, you know, in a homework setting where I'm just giving you something. Typically, you're going to, you're going to know, or you should at least be thinking, how do, I, how do I answer the question? What is essential? What do I want to make sure I, I retain in this problem? And that is the, those are the terms that, you, and, and, the, and the way to think about that is setting a pi group equal to one is saying whatever multiplies this pi group is important and cannot be neglected. And that's kind of the way I think maybe we can reframe this discussion of like the finding a reduced problem. It is kind of 
what is essential and let's make sure we don't neglect something that might be essential. And the nice thing is, is that like, if you're actually doing this in a research setting, I think the first problem is a really nice illustrative example of like, say you don't really know, or say you're confused, you can kind of do it a bunch of different ways. And we ended up with a solution in which we're looking at the kind of free vibrations. And you might end up with two sets of equations like we did with the first problem. And then it's going to be on you to be like, okay, what does it mean if the characteristic time scale is this versus the characteristic time scale of this? And it might take you a little bit to figure out like, okay, this is one in which I'm saying the characteristic time scale is kind of related to how I'm driving it versus the characteristic time scale is related to some material properties, which means it's kind of maybe just like something determined by the system itself as opposed to something I'm giving as an input. That might take time. But you can always kind of do this and say like, well, I don't really know if this is correct. Let me try it this other way. Set this other pi group equal to one. See what happens there. That is the more common way you're going to approach this. It's, it's not really ever going to be like a homework problem in your research career. You're either going to be reading a paper or you're going to be kind of working on something on your own. And you're going to have time to kind of play with it. And, and you know, that I think is where you'll kind of strengthen and develop your intuition for the problem. So, um, yeah. One, one sort of general question. Uh, all, the, all the problems we've done so far typically uh, approach where the systems of equations in there are the differential. Mm -hmm. uh, would, I guess this is a good but would it be would this same approach be applicable to an integral formulation of some problem or the other? Yes. Yeah. We don't really cover too many uh, um, Yeah, I thought about uh, going through kind of like integral based equations and it, it's something I didn't end up adding to this class. But in general, the procedure is going to work the same. The integ integration is going to be an operator that's acting on these variables. It's going to, even if you don't know what it's going to do, it's going to produce, you kind of, based on the dimension, based on knowing what an integral does, it's going to produce a, a certain dimensionality to the product. You can use all these same things um, to help with that. I don't think we directly apply that. We do um, a lot of kind of, a lot of the techniques you see in problems that are involving kind of integrations of quantities are a lot more of, you know, here we're basically, everyone's being forced to remember the chain rule and kind of applying it here. And the next thing that's going to happen, so the chain rule is essential. The next thing you'll see, I think you'll see this in like the third section of this course when we do variation of calculus, is the importance of integration by parts and the importance of um, the divergence theorem, or, or however generally you want to make it Stokes theorem, Green's theorem, all these terms are kind of saying, okay, like, I'm integrating a quantity. Can I separate the part of that integral that's integrating over the bulk of the domain versus the part of the integral that's integrating over the boundary of the domain? And those types of concepts, which is related to integration by parts, so those things are kind of all intertwined. We'll get into that, and so that's that's going to be kind of stuff that we have to recall to solve some of those problems. Oftentimes, those types of procedures help you, again, kind of throw away terms. Okay? We've done work in my lab where you know, we have this set of equations that's not possible to solve, but, but kind of identifying through the use of like applications of Stokes theorem, saying like, okay, actually, I can rearrange this so that I have a term that's acting in the bulk and a term that's acting in the quantity. And hey, look, this term that's acting in the bulk is really small. Maybe I can throw away that whole integral and just focus on what's happening along the edge, or vice versa. Those are the types of things, again, you're thinking relative quantities, how big or small is the thing, except you're just going to get to it a different way. So, yeah. All right, well, that's all I had for you all today. Please install Mathematica. Uh, please um, come look through the notebooks that I have on my website. And then we're going to go through the projectile problem again, but and dealing with the uh, perturbation approach on Thursday. Thanks, everyone.